the People Life Bible Church on Sunday is such an exciting and enriching experience that no one will want to be. And in this case, you will be made part of this happy and heaven-bound congregation as you listen to the message. You will never be the same again. Happy listening and God bless you.
Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you very much for this day of service. We bless your name for gathering us together. And we thank you because of your promise that your spirit will be with us. We pray, O Lord, that your spirit will teach us and prepare us for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. We pray that our service will be blessed of you today in Jesus' name. That no one, whether members or invitees, will come and, re and remain the same in Jesus' name. Bless all your people, dear Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. We thank the Lord for our service today. And today we want to consider an important message as we are all thinking about the coming of the Lord. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5. Hebrews 11 verse 5. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Here we find an individual whose life pleased the Lord. When you consider all his life, the details of his life, the testimony about him is that he pleased the Lord. There is a lot in that word that he pleased the Lord. But it was because of pleasing the Lord, the Lord took him away, that he will not see death. And it's a picture of the people that will be raptured, the people that will go with the Lord when he comes. Those of us who are getting ready and preparing for the coming of the Lord, we need to understand that it's only as we live the life that is pleasing to the Lord, walking with the Lord, that the Lord himself will find it be to take us away on that memorable and glorious day. In Genesis chapter 5, just to have a glimpse of the life of Enoch, and then to have an example of the life we ought to live. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 22, and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years. And he begat sons and daughters. And then in verse 24, Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. Here you find that number one, the rapture is a great possibility. He did it for Enoch, he did it for Elijah, he'll do it for the people that are waiting, getting prepared for the coming of the Lord. Not only that, it's very, very near. From all the things we have been studying, and from all the things around us, we know that the coming of the Lord is near. And what will it take? It will take you, it will take me as well, preparing so that we can meet our Lord. But I need to tell you that the condition of the world at the time of Enoch was very, very bad. He lived in the midst of multitudes whose lives displeased the Lord. He was in the minority that pleased the Lord. That tells us that no matter how evil, how corrupt the world around us may be, God's abundant grace is available for everyone, anyone that wants to live a life that is pleasing unto him. Of course, he'll be in the minority. But his life will be glorifying to God, and then he'll be of great benefit to the world around him. Look at the condition of the world at the time of Enoch. Look at Genesis chapter 6, reading from verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his, of his heart was only evil continually. In fact, in verse 6 we are told, and it repented the Lord. That means the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth and it gripped him at his heart. And yet in the midst of such people, corrupt people, evil people, sinful and wicked people, there was a radical change in the life of Enoch that he was able to please the Lord. If you are going to live such a life pleasing unto the Lord, that's possible. But then there must be a radical change in your own life. All men are born sinners. And the Bible says, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But when you repent and you have faith in Christ, that will lead you to a life of salvation. Genuine, biblical, life-transforming salvation will make the big difference in your life. There are three points we're going to consider. Number one, repentance. The beginning of a life that pleases God. The topic is, the life that pleases God. The life that pleases God. 
And the very beginning of that life is repentance. Number two, the realities of a life that pleases God. What are we to find in the life of someone that actually pleases the Lord? And then number three, the rewards of a life that pleases God. The rewards of a life that pleases God. Let's understand to start with that the human nature is so bad, the human nature is so corrupt, that in our own strength, without the salvation of the Lord, we cannot live the life pleasing unto the Lord. In Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 5, the Bible is telling us here that the natural man operates in his natural nature, human nature. And the human nature is sinful, very sinful. That's why the natural man cannot please the Lord. The natural man cannot please the Lord. In Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That's the natural tendency. That's the principle by which they work. They are committed to self. Self has become an idol. And self lords it over them. Self is the Lord and the Master. And because of that, a man like that, a woman like that, still in the flesh, born of the flesh, and is the flesh, and the works of the flesh he will do, he will not be able to please the Lord because he will do the things that are relevant or related to the flesh. In verse 5, it says, But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, but see, for to be carnally minded is dead. Those who have not been born again, they are carnally minded. There is no alternative. They cannot do otherwise. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject, it is not yielded, it is not committed, it cannot be submissive to the law of God, neither indeed can be so then. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. You see that if you have not been born again, or if the grace of God has leaked out of your life, and you have become a prodigal son, a prodigal daughter, you've gone into the far country, there's a separation between you and the Lord, you will not be able to please the Lord. You'll be so committed to self, and you will make self an idol. You will set self above God, and you will want to satisfy self at all costs. The flesh will be your Lord and will be your master. And in that state of mind and in that situation, you will not be able to please the Lord. In fact, the Bible says, for such an individual who has not been born again, the works of the flesh he will do. In Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 from verse 19. As I read these verses, 19 to 21, you might want to take a pencil or a biro, and then on another sheet of paper, write the things that you find in your life, which then will tell you on which side you are. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, is that in your life? Not repented of, and it's not cleansed away, and you are still in adultery, in fornication. Do you see that? Uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. Are you worshipping idol? Are you bowing down to something? Has money become an idol? Is a woman an idol in your life? Is a man an idol in your life? Is it property that is an idol? Or witchcraft, evil spirit, familiar spirit, or hatred? The grudge is there. You will not forgive. You have bitter hatred, bitterness against your fellow brother. Maybe against your wife. Maybe against your husband. Barriers, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envies. You envy people. You envy them because of the car they ride. You envy them because of the work they have. You envy them because maybe of their family. You envy them because of the privileges they have in life. That means you have the flesh and you cannot please the Lord. You are not ready yet for the coming of the Lord. Murders, how about abortion? Drunkenness, how about the smoking as well? Rebellies, that night parties, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You know why? Because such people do not please the Lord. When we are committed to self, when we do whatever we want, contrary to the word of God, when we are rebellious and disobedient to the word of God, and we do not allow Christ to reign in our hearts and to take his rightful position in our lives, that's not a life that is pleasing unto God. You say, I want to live a life pleasing to the Lord. Where do I begin? I'm glad you asked. In Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. 
the people of Nineveh, they were very, very bad. Maybe worse than you are. Worse than the people of this generation. But do you know they found favor in the sight of the Lord? And they began that life that was pleasing unto the Lord. How? Look at it. Jonah chapter 3 verse 10. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil. That means he relented from the evil which he had said he would do unto them. And he did it not. He just became happy with them. You know, how to make God happy with you? That you look at your life and you look at that life in the mirror of the word of God and say, yes, I know. I know God will not uh, be happy with idolatry in my life, adultery in my life, fornication in my life, drunkenness in my life, fighting in my life, you treating my wife, my husband. I know God is not happy. Oh Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. I repent. I turn away. That begins a life of pleasing the Lord in Psalm 147. Psalm 147, reading there in verse 11. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. The people that fear him and they say, yes, I know God is not happy, but I'm going to make God happy in my life. Therefore, I repent, I turn away from all my sins. And as you turn away like that, it says, the Lord will take pleasure in you. He'll be pleased with you. He'll be happy with you. All the sins you have committed, he will forgive, he will forget. He will not remember any of them against your life anymore. Because now you fear the Lord, you love the Lord, you are willing to obey the Lord. And you are saying, oh Lord, in my life now, thy will be done. We now come to Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6, reading from verse 7. The people there were asking a question, and the question they were asking is, we want to please the Lord. What does he want us to do so we can please him? They knew they were living lives of sin, and maybe they didn't know that all that God required from them was that they would repent, so that they can begin that life, pleasing unto the Lord in verse 7. Micah chapter 7, uh, chapter 6, verse 7. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? They were wondering, what are we going to do now that will please the Lord? He complains about us. He says, it's our lives are not pleasing to him. What shall we do that the Lord will be pleased? Does see want thousands of rams? So we will come to him and sacrifice to him, or we thank thousands of rivers of oil. They were thinking about some physical material things. They will give to the Lord, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? They knew they were sinners. They knew they were transgressors. They were asking, what will we give the fruit of, the, of my body for the sin of my soul? Then he said in verse 8, he has showed thee, O man. There is no pretense. We know what he wants. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? He said all he's asking for is that you've been living a life of pride. Bury that pride. Walk humbly with your God. You've been living a life of injustice. Throw the injustice away. Love mercy and be just and love people and do good unto the people. In verse 9, the Lord's voice cries unto the city and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod and who has appointed it. He was telling the people that all they required from them is that they will repent. In fact, the New Testament tells us, look at Luke. In Luke chapter 15, the New Testament here is telling us that there is joy in heaven when a single sinner repents. And if you are there today, you have not repented, you are still a sinner, you want to cause joy in the heart of our Father God in heaven. There is one way you can do that. You repent of your sin and the Lord will be so pleased with you, will be so happy with you, will be so joyful. In Luke chapter 15 verse 7, I say unto you, likewise... And that joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repented more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. That is, uh, the people that think they don't need any repentance, uh, there will be joy in heaven over the people that repent uh, more than the people that are self-righteous and they are not thinking of their lives, they are not considering their ways, they are not turning away from their iniquity and they are thinking they are still righteous. But when we say we repent, our repentance should be genuine. In fact, there should be an evidence for that, uh, for that repentance. There should be something in your life that shows that truly there is a genuine repentance there. That's why John the Baptist told uh, the people in Matthew chapter 3. 
Matthew chapter 3, looking at it in verse 8. Bring forth therefore the fruits meet for repentance. That is, there will be something that you will do that will show that you have actually repented. It means the things you did before one by one, you will consider them and you do them no more. And the places you went before, were you drinking before, you don't go there anymore. Were you among the gangs that were smoking before, you do that no more. Were you worshipping idols before, you will do that no more. Do you have what they call girlfriend, boyfriend, sin partner? You will do that no more. You will give yourself completely to the Lord. We find an example in the life of the children of Israel. When the Lord had accused them that they were not living right, and the things they were doing did not please him, and then Moses told them, Look, your lives are not pleasing to God. They took the right step. They turned uh, to the right way. And they pleased the Lord. And then the Lord showed that now he was pleased with them. Look at Exodus chapter 33 from verse 4. Exodus chapter 33 verse 4. As I read this to you, there are four things we are going to see. If we are going to actually show that we have the fruit of repentance, there are four things. Number one, a humbling of self. You give yourself to the Lord. You humble yourself before the Lord. You do not try to justify your actions anymore. A humbling of self. Number two, a hatred for sin. I know God doesn't love this. I won't do it again. I hate it with a perfect hatred. A hatred for sin. Number three, a heart passionately seeking to serve the Lord and to please the Lord. A heart passionately seeking to please the Lord. And you are asking, what will the Lord want? What does he want me to do? How does he want me to talk? How does he want me to relate with my wife, with my husband, with my neighbors? What does he want me to do to glorify his name? Your heart will be passionately seeking after pleasing the Lord. Number four, a habit, a new habit, a habit of devotion to the Lord. You were devoted to yourself before. You were devoted to the things of the world before. But now you want to please the Lord. Number one, a humbling of self. Number two, a hatred for sin. Number three, a heart passionately seeking the Lord. And number four, heart devoted or habit of devotion unto God. There is a total turning away from sin. And there is a truly trusting in Christ for salvation, which makes you a new creature. And then you please the Lord. Now we're looking at Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33, look at it there from verse 4. And when the people had these evil tidings, they mourned. And no man did put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, say unto the children of Israel, Ye are his deep necked people. I will come up into the midst of, of, uh, of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put up thine ornaments from thee, that I may know what I shall do unto thee. And the children of Israel strip themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. You see the worldliness that had crept in into the lives of the children of Israel. You know in the earlier chapter, chapter 32, they worshipped idols, they brought out earrings, and then they made a car, they were dancing around it, and they were playing the play of the unbelievers. But the Lord said, I'm against you. I will disinherit you. Your life is not pleasing unto me anymore. And then they removed all the jewelry. They removed all the worldliness. Everything they saw that was displeasing to the Lord, they removed. And look at verse 14, and he said, my presence shall go with thee. I'm happy with you now. There is repentance. There is renewal. And there is a change of life. A radical change of life. My presence shall go with thee. And I will give thee rest. I pray God will grant us that same grace. That we will repent and turn away from anything in our lives that is not pleasing unto the Lord in Jesus' name. And if we do it, and the fruit is there, and the evidence is there, and the marks are there, the Lord will be pleased with us. I said the Lord will be pleased with us. And once again, He'll begin to do mighty things in your lives in Jesus' name. The question is, what are we looking for to know that our lives are pleasing unto the Lord? That leads us to point number two. The realities of a life that pleases God. If you are a child of God, here is the secret you are looking for. And you are saying, yes, I want to know. Yes, I want to do it. I want to please the Lord. What are the realities and the things the Lord wants me to do so that I will live that life that makes the Lord happy? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, reading from verse 1. Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received us, 
how ye have received the force, how ye ought to walk to please God, so ye would abound more and more. You will see here, Paul the Apostle writing to Thessalonians, he had told them about salvation, he had told them about the Lord Jesus Christ, and many of them had turned away from their sins, they had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You will find that in chapter 1, but now he told them, he said, furthermore, that means beyond and above that salvation, beyond and above the date that you are quoting, I raised up my hand, I came to the Lord, I repented, and then I was baptized in water. Furthermore, beyond all those things that we are talking about, he said, we beseech you, we are pleading with you. It is not just an event, a one moment experience, it is a continual life that is demanding from you and demanding from you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus. Of Christ. He said the exhortation we're giving you is not something personal and private with us. We're doing it by the commandment, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ that as you have received of us, how ye ought to walk, the teaching you have received, the commandment you have received, the word of God you have received, and how to please God so ye would abound more and more. For ye know in verse 2 what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus this, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. He said, you know the will of God? You know the things that will please God? That you do not remain at that level of just being saved. And then if you are not careful, other things will come in. Like you came into the lives of the disciples of Jesus Christ. And one wanted to sit on this side, and one wanted to sit on that side. And Paul the Apostle said, very quickly get sanctified, so that the things that happen to them will not happen to you. Let us command fire to burn all these people, because the enemies of Jesus, we hate them, we want to destroy them. Get uh, sanctified very quickly. This is the will of God, that the Adamic nature... This is the will of God, that the root of sin, this is the will of God, that the nature that still wants to revenge, the nature that still wants to retaliate, the nature that still wants to do something which is not in the perfect sense of the will of God, that nature will be taken away from you. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. When it says, if you attain from fornication, everything surrounding fornication, the look of fornication, the dressing of fornication, and the attitude of fornication, and the language of fornication, anything that will relate to immorality, you'll get away from them in verse 4. That every one of you should know how to possess its vessel. That's talking of our body. Our hands, our eyes, our ears, our legs, every part of us in sanctification and honor. Live an honorable life, a life that glorifies the Lord, a life of holiness, not in the loss of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother. There should be no fraud in the midst of the people that are pleasing the Lord. There will be no stealing. There will be no cheating. You will not take advantage of the people that are ignorant and then take something away from them because that the Lord is the avenger of all sorts as we also have uh, forewarned you and testified for God has not called us unto uncleanness but unto Holiness, that's the thing that pleases God. He wants us to live a holy life. He wants us to live in sanctification and honor. He tells us in Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Reading there from verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. You understand that? It says if we're going to please God, we will not please ourselves. You know as I do that many things that we want to do. If I do this, it will please me. It will make me happy. And then we consider ourselves false. But then the Bible says if we're going to please the Lord, we put others false. How will I talk? How will I act? What will I do that will please other people, make other people happy? And if you are married, think about the weaker vessel. Think about your wife. Because it says, we should bear the infirmities of the weak. What gives us problems in our families is because we are not recognizing the infirmities of the weaker vessel. And then, like men, we want to jump on them and pounce on them and drive them and make them do what we want at the time we want it. Bear with them. That's the life that pleases the Lord. 
the life that is considerate of other people, the life that is merciful, the life that will know this is the weakness of this brother, this is the weakness of my wife, this is the weakness of my husband, and I will avoid that area so that I will not be a problem to my wife, I will not be a problem to my husband. How about the children? The children are weak. The children are weak emotionally, and therefore you want to consider them to you. If I say this way, my child will be discouraged. If I say that way, that child will not be able to know what to do. You bear the infirmities of the weak. How about the new converts? The new converts among us. We look at them. We bear the infirmities of the weak. We don't please ourselves. We are there to serve the young converts. We are there to serve the people. And then the men and the women in the church, if they are weak in one area or the other, I don't mean they are weak and they are living in fornication. I don't mean they are weak and they are smoking. I don't mean they are weak and they are drinking. If they are weak in some peculiarities or the other, we will look at their infirmities not to please ourselves in verse 2 let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification you are asking the question how can i edify my brother how can i edify my sister what will i do that will contribute something positive to the spiritual growth of my brother or my sister do we think like that in the things we do or do we just say this is what i want this is what will please me and since that is what will please me that's what i want to do in verse 3 for even christ please not himself you see, if you are a Christian, a Christian is a derivative from Christ. That he is a Christian is the one that is born of God, born of the Spirit of God, and the life of Christ is transferred unto him. And as Christ pleased not himself, so we who are Christians, we are not here to please ourselves. You are not in that local church to please yourself. You are to please the Lord. And you are to help other people and please them, make them happy. As it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Let's look at the life of Jesus because we are now given the example of Jesus that we should follow after his test because he didn't please himself. He came here to serve. He came here to please the Lord. In John chapter 8, John chapter 8, verse 28, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. Remember, Jesus is our example. It's your example, my brother. It's my example to you. It's your example, my sister. If we are going to please the Lord, you know what we're talking about? We're talking about the people that will make the rapture. We're talking about the people that when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and we which are alive, we shall be cut off. We're talking about the people that will have part in that glorious experience we're waiting for, which will take place anytime from now. And what did Enoch do that he was translated like that, that he took part in that glorious rapture? He pleased God. If we are to take part in that rapture, you know what it means? It means we are to please the Lord. We are to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ and says that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. In verse 29, and he that sent me is with me, is watching me. He looks at my thought. He looks at my action. He looks at my motive. He is with me. He knows what I'm planning. He knows if I want to revenge. He knows if I want to retaliate. He knows if I want to oppress. He knows if I want to steal. He knows if I want to commit sin. He knows your life. He is with you all the time. Jesus said, the Father, He is with me. He has not let me alone. You see, it says, for I do always, morning and afternoon. I do always, when friends are around, when enemies are there. I do always, when my persecutors are near, I do always those things that please Him. That means in the secret and in the public. That means when you are with your family and your place of work. That means in that office where no believers are, and you are the only one there with that other sinner, the Lord is there with you. Everything you are doing there, are you pleasing the Lord? If you are kissing her, the secretary, are you pleasing the Lord? If you are stealing money there, are you pleasing the Lord? If you are having a backyard deal, and you want to defraud your company, are you pleasing the Lord? The Lord is seeing you. And if you want to make the rapture, Jesus said, I'm laying the example for my believers, for my followers. I'm laying the example for the people that will be called Christians, I do always those things that please the Lord. If you are going to please the Lord, there's one qualification, there's one attitude that is necessary. There's one condition of heart, one condition of life you must possess. We'll find it in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. 
For do I now persuade men, or God? Or do I seek to please men? If I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. What he's telling us here is that your relatives, they will like you not to believe in Christ. And they will like you to remain with them in their old religion. And then Paul the apostle said, if I please them, and I deviate from sound doctrine, if I please them and go with them to their false religion, I will not please the Lord. There are some people in some other churches, they are not preaching holiness, they are not preaching sanctification. They may have their own peculiar pet doctrines they are preaching, and your relatives who are going there, they want you to join them. And uh, if you please them, if you say the pressure is too much, I cannot bear it alone, I cannot stand alone, I think I will have to compromise with them. Once you compromise with them, you cannot please the Lord anymore. He said, if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of men, eh, of God. Is there a particular woman that is putting pressure on you, commit sin with me, be my friend, and eh, do this and do that? And then you say, the pressure is too much. I think I need to yield to her. If you yield to her, you cannot be a servant of God, a child of God anymore. Once you please a sinner to commit sin, in Second Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 4, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. If you are going to please the Lord, there are many things of the world. You will not be entangled in them. In your place of work, they will call you into the association. There are things, affairs of the world, you will not join them. In the community where you live, or maybe the language people that, uh, you know, where you came from, they, there will be a kind of a meeting. They want to drink there. They want to remember the name of the idol of that uh, tribe. You will not join them because, you know, it says no man that war is. You are in a war. You are in a warfare. You are fighting against the devil. You are fighting against the system of the world. You are fighting against principalities and powers. If you are going to please the Lord, you will not be entangled with the idolatry, with the merriment, with the, with the feasting of this world. That's what the Lord is telling us there. You want to please the Lord. It means that you are living a life of faith. You are living a life of righteousness. Because we know faith pleases God. That's how, uh, that's how uh, Enoch pleased the Lord. He walked by faith. That's how Abraham pleased the Lord. He walked by faith. That's how people like Isaac and Jacob and Moses and others in Hebrews chapter 11, they pleased the Lord. How? They walked by faith. Unbelief displeases God. When you read the word of God and you don't believe, obedience pleases God. Disobedience displeases Him. But if you are walking by sight, if you are following the ways of the world, if you are indulging your flesh, if you are murmuring and complaining, every little thing in your local church, you murmur, you complain. If you are oppressing the weak or the weaker vessel, if you are taking advantage of the ignorant, if you are compromising the truth to please men, if you are sinning secretly because no church member is there, you are displeasing the Lord. When you repent and you are restored and you come back to the life of faith, the fruit of the Spirit will be in your life. You will be pleasing the Lord. You will be living the life of Christ that lives to please the Lord every time. It means, number one, you have the grace of God in you to keep you away from sin. Sin is coming like this. Temptation is coming like this. You say, no, I'm a child of God. I'm waiting for the coming of the Lord. He may come in the morning, afternoon, or evening. And the trumpet may sound any time. It may be this thing that I will do that will disqualify me for the kingdom of God. I will not do it. Number one, you want to please the Lord. There will be that grace of God in your life to keep you free from sin. Number two, prevent you from yielding to temptation. That thing is always checking you. Don't put your leg there. That thing is always checking you. Don't contribute to that conversation. That thing is always checking you. Don't put your hand in that deal, in that kind of business. It's always checking you to prevent you to yield to temptation. Number three, to restrain you from copying the world in all your actions. In all your actions, you're asking yourself, is this an action Jesus would have done or is this an action that the world is doing? Number four, it will help us to live the overcoming life, a righteous life that pleases the Lord. Tell me. What's the Spirit of God telling you now? Is the Spirit of God bearing witness in your heart 
that you are pleasing the Lord. Heaven is happy about you. You look at your past. You look at your present. You look at your motive. You look at your thoughts. You look at your actions. The Lord follows you to your office. He follows you to your house. He follows you to the everywhere that you go. Is the Spirit of God bearing witness that you are pleasing the Lord? Or is there condemnation, accusation that you are not pleasing the Lord? You are a compromiser. You are a backslider. You are not doing the will of the Lord. Then you want to come to the Lord so that you will surrender to the Lord and say, Lord, from today, thy will be done, not my will anymore. I want to be like Jesus in everything that I do so that my life will be pleasing unto the Lord. I will love the Lord with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind, and I will be obedient unto him. If we do that, what is the reward? That brings us to point number three, the rewards of a life that pleases God. The rewards of a life that pleases God. And we come back to the experience and the life of Jesus Christ once again. In John chapter 8, John chapter 8, verse 29. And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not let me alone. For I do always those things that please him. Here we find the presence of God, the power of God, always for the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, he that sent me is always with me. Is, am I in the storm? The Lord is with me. Am I in the midst of enemies? The Lord is with me. As circumstances subside down in my life, there is nothing to fear. The Lord is with me. He that sent me is with me. Why? Because he knows I'm here not to do my will. He knows that I'm always checking up the divine plan. What he, uh, what he sent me for. What he told me to do. I am 100% in the center of the perfect will of God. And because of that 100% obedience, because of that 100% yieldedness, because of that 100% submission unto the will of my Heavenly Father, the divine presence is always with me. That's the reward. If we are following the Lord, if we are serving the Lord, if we are obeying the Lord, the divine presence of the Lord will be a continual experience in our lives. In Numbers chapter 12, Numbers chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, we read of the experience of Moses. Here the Lord said, concerning Moses, my servant is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. That's what it means to please the Lord. Faithful in all my house. Everything he did, everything he said, everywhere he went, all the relationship he had with people, he was faithful unto the Lord. He would always think, what will the Lord say? What's the commandment of the Lord? How does he want me to behave? My servant Moses is not so. He is my servant. I know him. He's different from Miriam and different from Aaron. My servant Moses is not so. He is faithful in all my house. In verse 8, with him will I speak mouth to mouth. That's the reward. That's the reward of the people that are living lives that are pleasing to the Lord. There will be no secret he'll keep away from you concerning your life, concerning your family, concerning things around you. Anything that he knows that he needs to share with you so that there will be the fullness of his glory in your life. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently. Not in dark speeches. You will not need somebody to interpret it for you. He will not speak to you in dark speeches that you cannot understand. The similitude of the Lord shall be behold. Therefore, you see, you understand, if you really want to uh, have the reward of the presence of the Lord and the reality of His uh, re revelation in your own life, you want to live a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. In First John, First John chapter 3, verses 21 and 22, Beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, we have confidence toward God. That's one of the consequences or one of the results of pleasing the Lord. If you are living a life that is a giving to the Lord, there is no condemnation. You check up your life. The Spirit of God is not knocking at anything. You are not being condemned for any small sin or any great sin, any shady sin, any dubious sin, any ambiguous sin. Your life is clear. Everything is open before the Spirit of the Lord. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then are we confident toward God. And whatsoever in verse 22 we ask, we receive of Him. Because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. It means that He answers our prayers speedily. He answers our requests. He gives everything to us in such a manner that even before we finish the prayer, the results are already there. In Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, reading from verse 7. When a man's ways please the Lord. When a man's ways, plural, a man's ways please the Lord. 
It means it's not just one way. There are some people in one way they are pleasing the Lord. In many other ways they are displeasing the Lord. But when you look at the totality of your life, the details of your life, and then everything is pleasing unto the Lord. The Lord checks you up here. You are pleasing to Him. He checks you up there. You are pleasing to Him. He checks you up in the other environment. You are pleasing to Him. When all our ways please the Lord, He maketh even His enemies to be at peace with Him. He touches your enemies. He melts their hearts. He changes their hearts. He transforms them. Just like He did in Esau. And Esau then, when Jacob's life was pleasing to the Lord, the enmity was taken away. All the problem between Esau and Jacob, everything vanished away. And if you want your enemies not to be able to hurt you, if you want your enemies to be touched in their hearts, to be transformed in their hearts, that they will not be able to do any evil. In fact, they open their mouth like Balaam. They want to curse you. Blessing will come out. All you need to do is to live the life that is pleasing unto him. In Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Verse 24, here we're reading about another person. This is Caleb, and my, about my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and has followed me fully. That's pleasing the Lord. He has followed me, not partially, not half of the way, not three quarters of the way. He has followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. That means then that the Lord will be preparing heaven for you. As Jesus said in my father's house, how many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. He said concerning Caleb, I'll bring him to the holy land. I'll bring him to the land of promise. I'll bring him to the pleasant land. And so he's telling us, if we want to get to that pleasant land, to that holy land, to the land of heaven, the promised land, it means that we should follow the Lord fully. You'll be pleasing the Lord. You check up your life, and anything that is not in line with His will and His word, you take everything away. And then you say, Oh Lord, I want to please you. There is nothing else I'm living for. Within and without, around, above, beneath, everything that touches me, everything I touch, anything related to me, I want to, I want it to be something pleasing unto the Lord. Let's come back to Hebrews chapter 11 before we round up. Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because he had God had translated him. But for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. You understand this is talking about the rapture. The rapture was not to be at a some time. It is to be in our own time. The rapture is peculiarly for the church age. But this man was different from the people in his community. He will not compromise. He kind of put himself, he differentiated, he distinguished himself. Although they were bad, by the grace of God, the grace to become good was in his life. And although the people were doing evil, they were messing up their lives, he made up his mind, if I'm the only believer in this community that will live the life that is pleasing to God, I will do it. And he did it for 300 years, continuously, continually, without debating to the right, without debating to the left. And the Lord said, what this man does not qualify for, that is the rapture, that should not take place in his own time, I'll give it to him. He took him away without seeing death. If he did it for Enoch, how about the people that are living today? You understand what we're studying already? We're studying about the coming of the Lord. And we're seeing that the Lord will soon come. And all the things of the world, they're getting ready. And they're just like we had at the time of Sunday Scripture. Everything is getting ready for the trumpet to sound. There is nothing else we're waiting for now. The trumpet can sound at any time. And then the dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive will be caught up together with them. Then temptation will be over. Problems will be over. Tears will be over. Hunger will be over. Joblessness will be over. And no wife, no husband. Everything will be over. Problems. All the anxieties of life, the storms of life. Everything will be over. It will wipe away all tears from our eyes. And then we will go to be with the Lord. But the people that are not ready, not pleasing the Lord, they will remain here. And if you think we are crying now, that is the time crying will begin. That's the time hunger will begin. That's the time famine will begin. That's the time, the time of the Antichrist when all those evil things will, will begin in a real multiplied form. But I'm praying that you will not be there at that time in Jesus' name. You will be ready. I said you will be ready. 
you must be ready because you know what else are you living for if only in this life we have any hope we are forming the most miserable but we are not because we are not here because of those material things we are waiting for the coming of the Lord and I know by the grace of God you will be there on that day you will smile all tears will be wiped away from your eyes but it will take you fulfilling the condition living by the grace of God a life that is pleasing unto the Lord please stand up and open your heart to the Lord let the spirit of God examine you. If there is something there, a character, a habit, a, a backsliding perhaps, any, anything in your life that the Spirit of God is pointing to, this is not good, this is not right, this is not pleasing unto me, let the blood of Jesus wash everything away. Let the grace of God come into your life. Let the Spirit of God bear witness with your heart before you go away this morning that everything is alright now. You are rapturable. If the rapture should take place, you are ready. Be ready for the coming of the Lord. If you are going to be ready, you'll live a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. The Lord can do it for you this morning and make you ready for the coming of the Lord. Please pray and pray until you are born again. Pray until you are sanctified. Pray until you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Pray until everything is set right in your life. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 